Welcome back to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking. It's called Custom Justice, but if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this podcast has been dedicated to interviewing people who also wrote about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame the past. Stories of hope live here. So just to recap, last week we had Dana S. Diaz on the show. She's got back with us again today because she didn't get a chance to finish her story and what a story it is. If you had a chance to listen to it, I'm glad you did. But if you didn't, you're missing out. <laughs> um, <laughs> When we left off, she had just said something about him firing off a gun outside of her bedroom while she was sleeping. So we're going to pick it up there. Dana, that had to be terrifying. I, I, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and to give people a frame of reference, you know, I don't want to say most people, but generally people live in, let's say, a city or a town or a subdivision. You have people living next door to you. You know, and I have to give you this, you know, where I was, we had a four acre property, which is not very large in the scheme of farms. It was a little farm, but in a rural area outside of town. So yes, I had neighbors on either side of me, but everybody had acreage. The neighbor, you know, to the one side had maybe 30 acres. The other neighbor, I think had like seven. So, you know, this is not like somebody's right next door and somebody's going to call the cops and even the cops 45 minutes away, because where we lived, we were under county jurisdiction, not a town jurisdiction. So, you know, just to imagine being in that situation, um, you know, knowing that help is not anywhere near you, you are, I, I was alone in this house, my son, for the first time, since, you know, his dad had moved out and, and we divorced and all this stuff happened. It was the first time he just wanted to go and be with his friends and hang out and sleeping over at a friend's house. And I just wanted him to be 17 and live his life and not deal with, you know, the, the tension and all this stuff, all this adult stuff that really had nothing to do with him. You know, I just wanted him to have some normalcy, which I think any parent would want for their kid. So he was gone. I'm there alone. I'm in bed in a small, small little house on this property where I know nobody else is near and, <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? And the other part of that is it is pitch black. I mean, when you're in the country, anybody who lives in a small town or in a rural area understands what I'm saying, that when it is nighttime, there are no street lights. There's, you know, the only lights are lights coming from inside or at the exterior of homes. So, it, you know, there's nothing. It's black. It's dark. I don't even know where he is outside, except generally behind the house, outside the bedroom window. But it's not like I could see where he's going or see shadows of any kind. So from the bed, I hear these gunshots, not even sure how I got from the bed <laughs> to the corner. Um, we had a lot of, we had windows on three sides of this bedroom. And so I was in a corner kind of in the middle of the one wall, if this makes any sense, it was like a little alcove area um, because of the layout of the room, but on the wall without windows, because I had had enough thought in as fast as this all happened to make sure I was away from the windows. Um, you know, I'm on the phone with 911 and I mean, just hysterical, just hysterical, like even hearing myself I didn't even, it was literally like having an out of body experience because I didn't even sound like myself. Um, so yes, terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Um, and again, knowing that help is 45 minutes away, our house was very small. He could easily get in the, the entry door for our house was actually a glass door. So that added a little bit too, because I'm thinking all he has to do is shoot, kick it in, whatever. He's in the house. All he has to do is walk through a very tiny living room up the stairs and there's my bedroom where I am. I could have been dead in two minutes. And, you know, 
to backtrack for anyone who did not listen to the first part of this, I, <laughs> he, he had sent me messages. He was in the, you know, I had him kind of trained because I knew that things were getting really dicey with him more so than normal. I would just blame it on my phone because I didn't have a smartphone until right before then. So I would say, oh, the stupid phone, can you just text me or email me? It's just easier because I wanted to make sure I had everything in writing. So I had had leading up to this all kinds of messages that I have printed out because I knew at some point I would need them for some kind of evidence. And there were threats, threat, he would threaten his own life, trying to make me feel guilty and put blame on me. He would threaten, you know, he, he had said in one that it would be easier if one of us was dead, but the implication and the context was that he wanted me dead. And I knew he did. Um, so yes, I thought I was going to die that night. Um, Fortunately, the 911 um, um, person that was on the phone with me, um, she under I mean, it, she wanted to help me, thank God. Um, so she had actually had the foresight as well to contact the two local towns that were much closer. They could get to me within five to 10 minutes. So within about 20 minutes, believe it or not, I had two squad cars from each of the two nearby towns and two county cops, um, two cars at my house. Um, it was a scene and I still would not come out of that bedroom until I knew they had him apprehended because I was terrified because I, again, being pitch black, my house was pitch black, dark outside. It's pitch black. Um, all I could see at this point were the blue and red, you know, flashes along the walls, just reflecting off, which, eased my anxiety a little bit, but I still had no idea where he was or what he would do. Because let's be real, when somebody is acting that erratically, I don't know, is he going to start shooting at them? Is there going to be a shootout? You don't know. Right. You don't it's know. Like cornering a mountain lion. Literally. But, you know, fortunately, um, she stayed on the phone with me. And at the point where she was informed that he had indeed been apprehended, she told me that there were two um, officers waiting at my door and that she would. And I said, please stay on the phone because I just you have to understand coming out of my whole life. I just can't trust anybody. Even my biological father is a Chicago cop and I don't trust anybody. <laughs> just tone. So she stayed on the phone with me. I went first to the window to look out over where everybody was outside before I went downstairs. And I did see he was out there with his hands over his head, you know, being um, patted down and everything. So I felt confident. Okay. At least he's, you know, they, they actually do have him. He can't hurt me. So then I let the cops in, but you know, the frustrating part about all of it was, you know, this went on, this probably was an hour and a half roughly, um, that they were there questioning him, questioning me, um, looking around, but again, in the pitch black dark on four acres of property with, we had the main house I lived in. There was a little separate in-law house. There was a 3000 square foot barn. There was the cow barn. There's the chicken coop. There's all these structures like who knows where this gun went? Who knows where the shells are? He obviously had had time to get rid of whatever evidence. He was denying it. He actually had the nerve to say that he knew that I had taken um, a date somewhere recently and that, you know, it was probably that guy. I probably pissed that guy off enough that he was shooting. And I'm like, give me a break. He And then, you know, I said, I actually know for a fact that he was drunk. Um, and they said, what, cause I said, I saw him earlier. It was like at 11 o'clock that morning buying a case of beer. Um, <laughs> and he starts early on the weekends. So they said, well, we can't, he's obviously blatantly drunk, but we can't arrest him for that. And, you know, here I am on this property that, you know, he's saying one thing, I'm saying another. The property is just in my name. I'm the only one on the title indeed, because in the divorce, he wanted no part of this house. I thought I would, I didn't either, but I wanted to keep it because my son had one more year left of high school. I thought for his stability and his sanity, 
let him be in his childhood home for the rest of, you know, till he graduates and moves on. That was, I think, the right thing to do. So this guy just had no business being there, but they would not remove him. So, um, you know, after everything was said and done, he was not charged. He was not arrested. He was not removed from the property. I said, there's no way in hell I'm staying here alone by myself tonight and you leaving him here. So I will leave. And I packed a bag um, and, you know, they obviously didn't feel comfortable letting me leave alone. So they agreed, uh, all these officers that three squad cars would, um, two would lead me and one would follow behind me to where I was going to make sure I wasn't followed. And the three would stay behind to make sure until they had word that I had safely reached my destination, they were not going to leave my ex. So, you know, they wouldn't do anything, but at least they had I guess I can be thankful that they at least had the, you know, conscience to make sure that I was safe. But still, that tells me that even they knew that their system and their rules and their policies were not, you know, they were not working for the right person in, in this situation. And that's what worries me is that I got out okay. Um, you know, I'm alive, I'm here, I'm safe, but you know, how many people don't get out? How many people have something happened and it's set up to look like a suicide or or they are just, you know, yeah. something violent happens in a rage or it's planned or whatever, or you hear like you watch 48 hours and you hear about people hiring hit men because let me tell you, this happens at all um, income levels, all levels of society, um, you know, it, it can affect anybody. And I love that the police were willing to take it seriously. I mean, it's terrible that the judge didn't take it seriously and only gave you a 10 foot restraining order. I think that's a joke, yes. but my husband and I were talking earlier this morning and the case of domestic violence came up. Um, I was telling him briefly about your story. He wants to listen to the podcast. He's excited about it, <laughs> um, <laughs> but he told me he's, you know, he says, it's always so frustrating that people aren't able to leave. And it's like, well, right it's, there's a lot to it. There are layers to it. And saying yes. something like, why didn't you just leave is incredibly damaging to the people that eventually do get out and those that don't. Because what a lot of people don't talk about is that the highest fatality rate in domestic violence situations occurs when someone is trying to leave or has already left. Yes. And I have personally just since I've released my book and since I've been, you know, doing book signings and podcasts, it is so strange to me how many people have come forward it, that the reality is it gets more violent, even if they have not been violent, it gets violent sometimes after the fact, because all this happened after the divorce right. afterward. And it's, it's, you know, it's funny because I remember when I was in the, you know, it was 25 years long, but I remember telling people jokingly, even five years into our marriage, like, this is like survivor. Let's see who's going to make it out alive. Like, you know, and I said it jokingly, but I wasn't joking. It was kind of one of my ways of, you know. I, I, I use humor, humor a lot to kind of hide things that are going on or to make light of things. But that was like one of my little signals, like help, help, <laughs> you know, yeah. but you know, not long after the first time I made that joke, I remember I had a friend that we had like this little pact that every single morning I had to email her before 9am and, it, and just to say, I'm alive. I'm good. My son and I are okay. Wow. And the direction was, is that if you ever didn't hear from me at 9am, call and get a wellness check because we weren't sure. And the thing that people don't understand is how many accidents do happen. I did, I did not, you know, they make you out to be crazy to other people. So you can't go around telling too many people or anybody what you're really feeling. But I knew long ago I mean, literally five years into the marriage, I knew he wanted me gone. And when I say gone, I mean dead. And 
<laughs> it's, it's very hard to share a bed and share a home and try to raise a son. And, you know, all these things you're doing, go to school functions and sports events and family gatherings. And, you know, this person wants you dead. But think of what that feels like, you know, um, when he says, oh, you know, our son's, you know, with grandma today, why don't we take the boat out? I'm not going out on a boat with you on the river, just you and me, Uh, -uh because I'm pretty sure I don't know how to swim. I probably shouldn't be telling people that, but it's a shame. <laughs> I just don't like swimming. Um, I was just sure he was going to throw me overboard. Like, you know, they know you too. and, and he probably would have, and it would have been, Oh, oops, there was an accident, you know? And he would have just shot that propeller up a little bit too much, shred my body. Like, you know, and that's the thing is that like, even my husband, you know, when I used to tell him some things, you know, he'd be like, gosh, you sound like you jump to conclusions. And I'm like, it's not about jumping to conclusions. It does sound like that. It sounds, you know, a little, it does sound a little paranoid, but you have to understand from the world that I come from, I have been abused for over four decades. So to me, I always have to look at people in situations, assess it, figure out every possible scenario figure out what's the most realistic scenario that's going to take place and act accordingly. Um, and I have to do this in, a, in the snap of a finger in every situation. That is how I've lived. I think that's what people call when they say you're, you're in a state of survival. That's what it is. You're acting on animal instinct. And if that makes it that I'm jumping to conclusions or paranoid or whatever, you can call me crazy. Lord knows ever, you know, had that label for a long time, but it's reality for victims, you know, it, and it's very sad to have to live that way. But when domestic violence comes up, you know, yeah, people are so shocked and, oh, he was such a nice man and a member of the church. And, you know, they have all these things to say, but it's like all this stuff is happening, but the, the, the victim is always silenced, always silenced because they're afraid or they're shamed or whatever reason. And when you do open your mouth, yeah, the 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 shame of somebody saying, well, if it was so bad, why didn't you say, you know, why didn't you leave? As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You can show support by purchasing one of my mini books or donating through PayPal, or even just leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description under the guest information. As always, a portion of the proceeds of everything made do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Now back to the guest. So once you were able to get out... What were the next steps for you once you were able to get away from him and you're starting to try to process everything and to heal? What was it that helped you? Were there people, were there institutions, resources, services? Honestly, you know, once I was, you know, I think being safe is a very critical element for anybody you know, it's hard to heal when, when your nervous system and, and everything in you is still kind of like, you know, the cat with the ears up and the claws out. So yeah, once we were out of that house, because that just the house itself was triggering. So come spring, you know, my son was graduating high school. He and I, you know, I never did anything without him. We were a team. We always had each other's backs. We agreed we're selling the house. We sell the house. We're out. Um, in the meantime, I had become engaged to who I am now married to, who I'd known for a very long time. Um, and we just decided, why not? You know, we we already knew each other. We didn't need to do the get to know each other thing. We didn't need to get to know each other's families. My kid knew who he was and he was like, oh, okay, cool. Like it was not a big deal at all. It was almost too easy. So we kind of just skipped over all that other stuff people have to go through, but we were going to be moving in with him. So we're in a safe place. My nervous system's calm, like everything's good. Then that's when I was like, okay, now, now I can take on this healing stuff because I think people think like, 
you're just going to like go to therapy and one day wake up and this magic wand will, you know, with the little sparkly stars is going to come sprinkling over your head and you're just magically, you know, like a baptism of sorts, like, oh, it's just all better now. And it's not that way. If it was please point me in that direction. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but- if that's the way it worked, everybody would be going to therapists. Literally. And, have the magic. <laughs> Literally. and I'm going to be 100% honest. And it's just my personal opinion for me. I am not a fan of talk therapy. Um, it, it just, at that point, when I was ready to heal, I thought it was too triggering for me to even think about on Thursday at two o'clock, I'm going to this place. And this is the subject of, you know, I wasn't there yet. That would have, I would have just been sweating bullets and ruminating all night for like three days before that. And, you know, plus it costs money. And, and my issue is that a lot of people, especially coming out of abusive situations, sometimes don't have, they're just trying to figure out where to live and how to start over. They don't have insurance maybe, or they don't have insurance that would cover it. So I always look at alternative sources uh, and being a writer and somebody who appreciates words. um, You know, I think for me, when I decided to heal it, I kind of took it on myself at first just kind of reconnecting with who I was, because when you come out of an abusive situation, especially with a controlling narcissist, they have been telling you what to say, how to say it, what to wear, how to do what to like uh, dictating everything. So I just had to literally, I sound silly, but just starting like with, okay, I really like red nail polish on my nails. Maybe I'm going to paint my nails, right? Yes. It's cute. (laughs) Sorry. For the people People that are listening, I just showed off my red fingernails. She has like these gorgeous red nails right now. Just, and it (laughs) made me excited because that's my favorite color. And I was just talking about that. So, (laughs) but see, that's the thing, like the little joys, I think you have to reconnect with who you are. I know my ex was very like, I mean, he would tell me what music I couldn't listen to, what to wear, stuff like that. So I was just like, you know what? I like this dress or I like that shirt or what I'm going to wear it. I'm going to wear that lipstick that he told me I looked like a whore in because I actually think it's cute. It's a little bright, but you know what? Why not try it? I'm going to wear it, you know, stuff like that. I think you have to just honor yourself for a minute and just remind yourself of who you are because that little joy that you're going to feel is it's kind of going to be there to soothe and console you if that makes any sense when you are ready to like, just like plunge into all that darkness that you have to basically confront, like look straight in the eye, um, you know, and deal with when, when you are healing. So I just kind of took care of myself and indulged my little, you know, like reminders of who I was. And then I got into just like free writing and notebooks. I would have just like these moments where I would just sit down and literally write no monitoring, no, you know, worrying about if something's right to say or not right to say, or do I really feel it? Just every thought that was coming as fast as I could write, just getting it out there. Um, You know, and out here we have fire pits, you know, so I would just like read it over, cry about it, burn it, like just release it, you know. And then I started reading more about writing therapy and I, and I did, you know, connect with, uh, it's the crappy childhood fairy online. She's phenomenal. Actually, (laughs) she is phenomenal. She is direct. She says stuff you don't want to necessarily hear, but she's dead on. And it, it kind of, um, she has a writing therapy that she, um, has people follow and it was so tremendously helpful for me. Um, and music, I, you know, in Gasping for Air, my book, the chapter titles are actually song titles because when I was a little girl being abused, I would get in trouble for opening my mouth and standing up for myself or telling somebody they were wrong. Or, you know, I mean, when I got older, I I was calling my abusive stepfather an a-hole because he was. And then I would get, you know, pushed or shoved or whacked or whatever, slapped across the face, whatever. 
but um, music was always safe. Music did not get me hit or in trouble or pushed out of cars or any of the things that happened. So I found that if I, you know, sang music or just even played it and, and the lyrics would really express, you know, things that I couldn't express myself but I couldn't get in trouble for listening to it. So it was just kind of my outlet. So I just tell people just do what feels right to you. There's art therapy now that I've heard of music therapy. There's so many different ways. And if you want to go sit and talk to somebody every week at three o'clock on Thursday, then that's, that I I know people who have had a great benefit, but I think we all are unique individuals and we have our, our certain, you know, things we respond to and things we don't. So you know, I just always tell people you're ready to heal. Start with yourself. Just take care of you first. Take care of you. Figure out how you want to heal. And when you're ready, it's going to be nasty and it's going to be awful. And it's going to take a physical and emotional toll on you. Um, you're going to get a lot of headaches and stomach aches and you're going to probably want to sleep a lot. Um, but it'll be OK, because eventually when you come to accept everything that happened, for what it was and realize that you were not responsible and that's somebody else's burden to bear, you kind of release yourself of all that. And, and I think that's where healing really starts is, is not so much forgiving the other people for what they did, but forgiving yourself for carrying their burdens and their shames and their insecurities on your heart. Your book, Gasking for Air, people are able to find this through your website, um, and there's a link there that'll take you to the Amazon page, or you can just look for it uh, by looking for Gasping for Air by Dana S. Diaz. Um, I think it's an amazing book. I think you've done Thank you. something that is not exactly an easy thing to do. No. Um, and I didn't ask you ahead of time. I forgot to do that. But do you have a copy of your book, Candy? Do you have maybe one do. to two minutes that you would like to read? For yes. Us? Awesome. I, I do. I have a copy of the book. It's right here. If anyone, I can't even see. Oh no, it's not showing it as no, it's not showing it. Cause I have my background. Um, but yeah, I will, I, I wasn't sure what part to read cause I don't want to give away some stuff. So I thought I would read what I call the afterword, which is the, like the ending ending part. Cause I want to leave everybody with just some thoughts and some hope. Um, yeah. oh, okay, so bear with me, people. It's just two pages, I promise. By the time the movers came with their semi-truck at the end of April, the house was barren. Closets and cabinets were empty. No pictures or decor hung on the walls. Only the bed, sofas, and the large basement TV remained. Doug spent the last night at the house with us, and after Ryder left for school, he took the beds apart and assisted the movers. I wasn't used to people doing things for me, so I tried to help. Just have your coffee, sweetheart, Doug insisted. We'll take care of everything else. It won't take us long anyway. I smiled as he caressed my upper arm, knowing he wanted me to take my time saying goodbye to this place. So I stood at my kitchen sink in my gray pajama pants and lighter gray t-shirt, looking out the window to the back couple acres. The sun was shining, but I could feel the chilly spring air coming in through the open doors. I sipped my hot coffee to warm myself, noting this would be my last morning coffee here. We'd had lots of lasts during the past year. I didn't think they'd make me sad because I'd been so focused on ridding myself of this life, but this life made me who I was. It was writer's foundation. We couldn't deny the bad times, but we couldn't forget the memories made here either. After the moving truck pulled away, Doug came to where I stood in the kitchen. He wiped a tear from my cheek, then bent down to look into my eyes. You okay, love? I looked at his smiling face and couldn't help but smile back. He knew what I didn't have to say, and the empathy he communicated showed me love without words. As he straightened back up, I set my empty cup on the counter. I wiped under my eyes with both hands and licked the salty tears from my lips. Then I looked back up at Doug with hopeful eyes and took a deep breath. Whenever you're ready, I'll be in the car, he said. Then he left me to my final goodbye. Leaning back against the kitchen counter, I faced the living room. With everything removed, I barely recognized the place. It was like looking at someone you used to know, but not being able to match the memory of them to the person they are now. How could that be after 17 years? Tears filled my eyes again. 
I went upstairs to the master bedroom next to make sure we took everything. Some of the worst moments of my life happened here, I thought. Yet I struggled to reconcile how a room that helped my deep that held my deepest, darkest secrets also seemed so detached and foreign to me now. I mean, my son had been stolen from me in this room. Darren had nearly killed me with a forceful punch in the bed that used to occupy the space. Just months earlier, Darren had shot his gun outside these windows. I thought I was going to die in this room that night. Had I numbed myself for so long I couldn't even remember how to feel in this house? Or had life become that turbulent that I was unfazed by the chaos? Either way, I didn't want to take my old life into my new one, and that new one was outside waiting for me. So I shut the bedroom door, walked down the stairs, and solemnly closed the glass entry door. With one last look inside, I left all the broken promises, heartache, mistakes, and regrets with this unrecognizable old friend and pressed the lock button. Then I felt the cat rub herself on the back of my leg. Not. She was the last of our many barn cats to remain. Darren was supposed to have taken her, but here she still was two months later. I picked her up and snuggled her close to my face. She rubbed her head along my chin and cheeks eagerly. She'd always been so affectionate. I hated leaving her behind to fend for herself. Hopefully the new owners would love her as much as we did. I climbed into the car with her for a longer goodbye. Doug reached over and pet her on the head. Hi, nut, he greeted as she purred loudly. You coming with us? My sad eyes popped open excitedly. Can she? Well, we're not going to leave her behind, are we not? He coddled with a baby talk voice. His love of animals made me smile. It was the first quality that had drawn me to him years before. Ready? I closed the Jeep door and clicked my seat belt in the buckle. Freddy, I, I said as I gave Nut a deep massage as Doug proceeded down the gravel drive, though I think I needed the soothing more than she did. As I watched the farm fade away in the side mirror, I recalled the hopeful and naive young woman who'd first carried her nine-month-old baby into that house. I'd tried so hard to make a good life for him here. All the parties, bonfires, farm animals, trees, gardens. I just wanted to give Ryder the simplicity, peace, and happiness I never had as a child. A piece of me would always remain here, but that young woman was a distant memory, just like the life that had tried to break me down. But I'd prevailed. I'd learned to decipher friends from enemies and to protect and defend until the bitter end. I wore my battle scars proudly, too, as a reminder of where I'd been and what obstacles I'd had to overcome to get to where I was going. I'd risen above every challenge set before me and helped my son transform his own wounds into strength, wisdom, and maturity only life experience could provide. I was proud of the young man he'd become and prouder of myself for holding on to the hope of love despite it all. Love was all I'd ever wanted anyway. I thought I needed to earn it. I had gone to great lengths to get it. When I hadn't, I thought I didn't deserve it. But when I finally realized my self-worth, I realized love had been in me all along. You know, it, it brought tears to my eyes when you, um, <laughs> when you talked about arriving at the home with your baby in your arms and knowing that he grew up there. You sacrificed so much to make sure that he had a home and to make sure that he knew that his mother loved him more than anything else in, in the world. You're making me cry now. <laughs> and for all the people, exactly what I thought. <laughs> and for all the people who say, why didn't you just leave? Well, there you go. <laughs> it was, a it was all reason. for my son. You sacrificed yeah. your life for your child. That's how it felt. You don't have to die to sacrifice your life for somebody else. <laughs> That's the thing is that when my health came into play and, and my body was shutting down, I had to, you know, it, it killed me to have to break my promise to my son, yeah. you know, cause I had promised him that we would stay and, and that I would wait until he left for technical school after high school, but it, I had to choose me. And, you know, the thing is, I think so many people like me, you know, do these things for their kids and make these decisions based on their children. And, you know, at one point, you know, again, I mentioned my biological father is, you know, actually he retired recently from the Chicago police department, but, you know, he, after that, after my ex shot the gun, I mean, 
my dad was just very pushy, which was not his nature. But, you know, he said, if you knew the domestic calls that we get that we have gone on and they end up dead, they always end up dead and there's never a paper trail. Nobody has ever reported an instance, nobody, you know, because victims are afraid and he pressed me and pressed me. And, you know, eventually, you know, at one point I said, I can't, I promised my son. And he said, your son will get over it. You are the parent. You have to make the right decisions. He will get over it, but he can't get over it. If you are not here then what, what will happen then? And, and I had to really think about that, but he was right. You know, and he, he, you know, how many years as a cop did he see these things? And, and yeah, so, it, you know, we feel bad because we always want to do for our kids, but um, sometimes you have to do for yourself. And I think in the end, I, I learned maybe a little too late that, you know, me being happy and me being healthy was the best thing for my son, no he matter how that, that had to happen. He did. And, and the thing is, is, you know, he did, he, he would say to me, wow, I haven't seen you laugh and smile this much, or I'm glad that you have friends now and that you're going and, you know, having dinner with people and that you're, you have a life, you know, he never saw mom do those things and, and it did make him happy. So it was okay. And, um, if I would have known that I might've tried to make my escape a little sooner, but you know, the things we do, I think life has a path for us, whether, you know, we think we're in control and we try to be, and, and sometimes we are, sometimes we're not, but eventually I'd like to think that when we take the reins a little bit more and make better choices that we're where we're supposed to be. So that is why I, I wrote the book. That's why I'm, you know, on podcasts and speaking and, and, you know, meeting people and reaching out because I just want to show other people. And I'm not saying it's possible for every single person because there are really awful situations that I would worry more for somebody trying to leave than for them to stay. But I would like to think for most people that I can be an example of it's going to be okay. And it's going to be better and better than you imagined you know, I had a college degree in journalism and psychology, and he had me cleaning people's houses, scrubbing toilets, which I'm not one of those people that thinks I'm better than anyone else. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I was scrubbing toilets. And now I'm on podcasts all over the world. And I have two more books coming out. And that's not a brag. That's a point that you think you're in this circumstance in your life and that'll never happen. I'll never get out of here. I'll never be anything or do anything. Guess what? You can make that choice. You can make the choice. And once you make the choice, it may take some time, but you will find that when you have a goal and you're imagining that life that you want, you will start to work towards it. But if you don't see it, you'll never even try. So you have to act, you have to know that it's possible. Yes, absolutely. This has been probably one of the best uh, conversations with somebody I never met prior that I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so this, glad. This has been Amazing. And I haven't even gotten to my very favorite question yet. It's always my, oh. my favorite question. It's always my last question. Okay. And I end it with your answer. What is one thing that you truly love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? You know, I think I've had a hard time. I mean, self-love is new to me. Um, but one thing that I, I do, I don't know, I think it's just my sense of humor. And I don't think I've been able to really put it out on this podcast. But you know, like, my one best friend, she just makes me laugh, because I'll be dead serious telling her something. And she's like, it's just your delivery. Like you could be talking about like the worst possible thing that could happen to a human being. 
and the way you say it. And I don't know, I guess you'll have to get my book because another friend of mine read the book and she's like, I don't know how, but like some of the things you said in this book, like your, your thought process, she's like, you're, it's actually funny. And she says, I found myself laughing at things that aren't even funny. Like, so I don't know, I guess I like that about myself because you know, I can be a little snarky and whatever, but it's stuff that everybody's thinking. They just don't say it. And I am pretty straightforward. And I am that person in the room that will just say it. And I don't mean it offensively or in a bad way, but I can appreciate my sense of humor. And oftentimes I make jokes and I laugh very loudly and my husband's just sitting there silent and I'm just like, okay, I thought it was funny. So <laughs> tough room. <laughs> so I think it's just the ability to laugh also, if I could tag along with that. I just think that, you know, we, we are talking about some serious and dark stuff here, but my gosh, it feels so good to laugh and a smile and you have to find some joy in life, you know? I, it, so it's good to laugh. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to the other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com.